It is Friday here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, joined by Brian Batko. We're going to talk Steelers-Broncos, but we've been talking about the quarterbacks all week. we got to talk about the offensive line because it looks like a shake-up is happening. Troy Falton is starting. We'll talk about that. Give our pick six of the top six games to look at this weekend that aren't the Steelers-Broncos. And our keys to the game and final predictions for Steelers-Broncos all here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive Podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive Podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Brian Batko, one of our great Steelers beat writers. And as always, you can find the show on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you, if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this channel to get all of their Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive Podcast, as well as the daily content that comes out from all of our sports writers, including Brian Batko's Chipped Ham and Football. Every Tuesday this week, he had Rob King, new Steelers announcer here on the on the show on, right on this platform get all of that right here from the pittsburgh post gazette brian we have talked quarterbacks to death i mean really we kind of do it uh, all the time anyways so let's talk about the the group that does have some things going down right now and that's the offensive line now we did our practice report yesterday but brian i think it's time to take a, a big a closer step into figuring out what is happening here with this steelers offensive line because dan moore jr was back full healthy no limited capacity ready to go and does it look like he's going to stay in the starting lineup while Troy Faltano goes in? Because if that happens, that means Broderick Jones is getting benched. And that was not on my bingo card at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of training camp. Where I was thinking Broderick Jones was going to head to the bench this year. You know, I think the old saying goes, if you want to make God laugh, tell him what you think the Steelers offensive line is going to look like <laughs> on a year to year or even at this point, game to game basis. <laughs> they are uh, you. Mike Tomlin dropped thoughtfully non-rhythmic on Tuesday at his press conference. The Steelers seem thoughtfully non-rhythmic with the way they handle, uh, you know, drafting and evaluating O-line prospects, where to play them, where to how to configure the depth chart, how to let them compete. And yeah. I mean, based on some some things I'm hearing and sort of reading the tea leaves injury report wise and everything, it does seem that Troy Fautanu, now that he's fully healthy with that, uh, you know, preseason knee injury, hopefully behind him, they're not wasting any time. They're going to say, get up here and play right tackle. Dan Moore hasn't done anything to lose the D- Dan Moore's kind of like a squatter who he's like he's squatting at home, but he's actually doing a pretty nice job with the decor and he's like <laughs> making some improvements and upkeep. So you're like, you can't really kick him out right now. He's, so he's obviously like, he, he's like the dude in the Simpsons bar that you throw him out and he, he's just, you dust your hands off and he's standing, sitting right back yes, at the bar. Or that. Yes. He's just always there. Um, but no, I mean, Hey, if Dan Moore is fully healthy and remaining the starting left tackle, which, Mike Tomlin's given us no indication otherwise. And Troy Fouton, who's fully healthy. And, you know, you hearken back to our Jerry Dulac's reporting during training camp out in Latrobe that the Steelers were, you know, had it not been for that knee injury, the Steelers were, they weren't going to have him on the Broderick Jones plan. They were going to have him on the accelerated Mm -hmm. time to start week one, let's not mess around plan. And, you know, clearly uh, the, the injury threw a wrench into that to some degree, but, it sure seems like he's going to be in there starting ipso facto. That would leave Broderick Jones on the bench. He's not playing left guard, right guard, or center. So I still think it's only a matter of time, right, before the two first rounders that you've invested a lot in the last couple seasons are starting and playing together. But even after a week in which I, I felt like in Atlanta, it was kind of a, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it offensive performance, particularly from the O line, the Steelers want to make a fix and it it seemed like that shift happened you know either Wednesday evening or Thursday morning for whatever reason yeah and it's it's going to be interesting to see if they followed through with it uh because again it was just Thursday practice yeah it uh, could change it, we, we yeah. could you know this could be much ado about nothing it, it could be flipped uh right back but no at the very least it seems like there's just a lot of a lot of smoke to the Fautanu fire right now and I will uh be in the locker room today after practice trying to Talk to guys to see what's what's going on here and why. Bro, uh, you know, Brian, I think that there's a thought here that Broderick is a young player 
and you don't want to stun his growth. And if you bench him, you're going to send a bad message. You're going to mess with his ego and you're going to do this. I say to that, Brian, I think the Steelers are tired of egos. I wonder if they're going to be like, hey, hey, Broderick, you haven't played the best. We still think you're the future, but we got to play the best. And you, you haven't been the best uh, as of late. We're going to give this guy a shot. And their expectations are going to be like, you're going to handle this like an adult. You're going to not pout. You're going to just work and be ready for your next shot. And when you get it, you'll do well. And I wonder if that's the tone that the Steelers are using with this with this situation and saying, like, hey, we don't got time to worry about your egos. Like, you know, like Kenny Pickett, you know, didn't want to be the number two guy, two guy behind Russell Wilson. So he's so he's gone. And I wonder if that's the thing is that they, they, they are trying to not be dictated by those egos and saying, like, look, best players play. and We think he's the best player right now. Is, is that how you see this? Or do you think this is a, a, a misstep on the part of the Steelers as far as developing two young offensive tackles together? I hear you, Chris, but to that I would say, what about the comfort-seeking way they've handled Dan Moore over the last few years? I mean, why haven't they just told him to kick over to the right tackle side and learn to be a swing tackle? Good question. I mean, um, we've talked about that on the show before, and I'm not suggesting that it's like an, an ego-driven thing by Moore or anything like that. I, I I actually don't think it is. I think he's not confident in, in his abilities over there, and Perhaps the Steelers aren't either, and they actually feel like he is fine on the left side. But that that's probably the one thing I would quibble with there. And I, and I don't think Broderick Jones, like, I don't want people to feel like we are trying to imply that he's any sort of problem behind the scenes. I think it's the furthest thing from that, Right. actually. He's, it, it, he's, done, he's been a true teammate throughout all this. Yeah, he's he's done nothing but say the right things, and, and I don't think he does it in a disingenuous way. I think he does... Uh, genuinely feel like, yeah, I'm, he, he's got that O-line mentality of like, I'm just a, a big dude, you know, just I'll do whatever you ask me to do. As long as I'm on the field, I don't care. But what's what did I just say? Was like six words. As long as I'm on the field. Mm -hmm. He wants to be on the field. Anybody yeah. does. Yeah. So if I were him, I would probably have a little bit of a mentality of like, you guys have been asking me to switch back and forth. Come in as a left tackle when you drafted me. Don't start me right away. Okay, whatever. I didn't win that job over two vets. But now I'm playing some right tackle after we draft another guy. I go anywhere you ask me to go on a given day. I'm at the whim of, uh, you know, guys' injuries. And, I mean, I understand the more you can do, and that's all part of, you know, being a cog in the machine. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't think he necessarily played poorly in Atlanta. And now – I do sort of wonder if it was a misstep to not just roll those two guys out there from day one of OTAs, day one of training camp. Instead, Dan Moore had pole position at the position he's played the last three seasons and started. But man, maybe they should have just uh, you know moved ahead and moved forward with the two first round picks right off the bat. I still feel like, hey, unless it goes completely terribly, uh, Sunday at Denver with Jonathan Cooper rushing from that left outside linebacker spot and he wrecks the game, then okay. But otherwise, I, I think it's going to be a situation where this is just sort of the next step to getting to Jones, Fautanu, and you know Dan Moore probably has a pretty short leash at this point. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he uh, you know plays the rest of the season here. They let him walk, and and we're talking about. Uh, Broderick Jones being a guy who comes back in year three after not playing a whole lot in, in year two. There, there's a lot of ifs, a lot of hypotheticals right now with the Steelers O-line, but we kind of knew that's what they were signing up for when they drafted Troy Faltano in the first round. It is bizarre to me that Chuk Sikorafor, who was being paid tens of, like, oh, like I think at least like $10 million or, or more last year in the salary cap. Which was ridiculous, he, but go on. Which was a mistake in, in and <laughs> of itself, right. But like that guy has had a shorter leash than Dan Moore last last year. And by the way, Tuxa Korfu, who I thought was uh, more of a left tackle than a right tackle, was forced to play right tackle while Dan Moore played left tackle. But who knows? Tuxa Korfu can't even keep the job on the Patriots that he has right now. So maybe that's more about more about him. But and, and at least the public explanation for why he lost the job last year was, you know, kind of went beyond just his performance. It, it right. got into some. Yeah, I mean, he said, he said type of things. So, I mean, but anyway, you, you, go ahead, Chris. Let's make your point. No, no, no. I, but my, 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 my point, my point is you look, you look at that situation and I just think it's, it, it's, it's been, it's kind of 
a mixed mixed signals that the Steelers have had on how they've handled this offensive line and how they've they've been bringing guys up. Um, you know, I still think the the end goal is to uh, is to just is is to get Proutano at right, Broderick at left, like you said. But how they're getting there, that's a big question, and I, I get why people have reasonable at, at questions about you know, is this the right path considering you got Kendrick Green who was at center and, you know, didn't do well there and then went to Houston and then had a few good games. And then you have Kevin Dotson who was consistently at the guard position that he wasn't as comfortable with. And then he goes to the Rams and has a few good games. And people are like, well, what the heck, guys? Like, you know, how how are you not developing these offensive linemen when that was a big need for the Steelers? So, um, and again, like, you know, do those mean that these are wrong? No, but it certainly helps raise the question, is this the right way? And why I think that they're just going to be really close eyes on how whoever starts at offensive tackle plays this week. Yeah, they, they don't really have the benefit of the doubt or shouldn't get the benefit of the doubt is probably the best way to frame that. And the ultimate long-term wild card, too, is Troy Fautanu potentially playing guard at some point down the road just because his stature lends itself – more to the interior and obviously that's not what he's here to do right now and you know nobody would really want to uh, go down that path when you're relying on a guy as a tackle and you drafted a college tackle but clearly there were plenty of people in the pre-draft process who thought yeah he could stick a tackle but might make more sense to to put him at guard later on in, in his NFL career so uh, as the you know as the hourglass uh, turned, uh, what is it, as the world turns, the, the days of the Steelers' offensive line lives, uh, never a dull moment, it seems like, as they try to put this group together. Bringing all your soap operas out here, Brian. Uh, we're going to my soap operas, but yeah, the, 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 there we go. We're going to do our pick six next. We're going to talk about the six big games. It's a big NFL weekend. The Bills trounce the Dolphins on like Thursday sands through the football. hourglass. That's what it is. There you go. I was like, I was thinking like, I'm, I'm trying to remember that line too. We didn't, I don't know you. I never watched soap operas. I, I know my, about- my mom watched days of our lives like every day growing up. Oh, I think she man. still watches it every day. My, my grandma was a big Price is Right person. She had Matt Lock, Walker, <laughs> Texas Ranger, but not soaps, just those shows. Anyways, but we got to get we got to get to our break here. We come back. We're picking NFL games uh, as far as the, our top six games that aren't Steelers Broncos. And then after that, we'll get you our keys to the game and our final predictions for Steelers Broncos all here on the North Shore Drive podcast on the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. But first, I want to remind you, the show is brought to you by Smart Side. Here's a message from our friends at Smart Side. Between beauty and durability. Making your neighbors jealous has never been easier. Introducing LP Smart Side Expert Finish Trim and Siding, now in brushed smooth texture. Available in 16 versatile colors, LP Smart Side Expert Finish products help create timeless designs and beautiful, longer lasting dream homes. That's the beauty of brushed smooth. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Chris Carter, Brian Batko, talking all things NFL now as we get ready for uh, for week two here. Brian, we did last week our pick six. I didn't I didn't keep track of who you picked last week, but I know I went 14 and two in my overall picks of all the games last week. So I think I did pretty well. I went eight and eight against the spread. So ah, so you do against the spread. Okay, I don't, I don't, I don't mess. With I'm a real spread. man, Chris. I'm a real man. You you have a real gambling problem. That's what that is. <laughs> I'm in like a league with uh, you know, a guy I play basketball with, and he's like, "Hey, do you want to join my pick'em league this year?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure. Why not?" So okay, yeah, we, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. I, I'm I'm in 21st of 29 at eight I'm, eight. So time to pick it up. I'm in I'm in a group. I'm in another group where I'm 17th of like 350. So eat it. Uh, but yeah, when right. you guys when you guys grow up and start picking games against the spread, let me know. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, all right, all right. Let's get to the big games. Uh, last week, uh, the Cleveland Browns got trounced today. They were, you know, they were a team that a lot of people think, oh, this could be their year. They could rise up. And then uh, the Cowboys put a stop to that. Now the Cleveland Browns are on the road at the Jaguars. Uh, the Jaguars, three-point home favorites. That's usually about the spread you get for just simply being at a home team. So I think that they, the Vegas sees these two teams as pretty dead even. Brian, do, do the Browns get back on track this week, or do the Jaguars continue their misery? I don't know. I'm not really loving the vibes from either one of these two teams. Season long, a lot of distractions going on right now in Cleveland with Deshaun Watson and everything. And 
seems like there's always drama brewing with the Browns. So I'm actually going to take the Jags at home, but I'm going to say in a, in a close one. Um, so I'll, I'll take Jacksonville in this one, but I don't feel great about it. I don't feel great either, but what kind of gives me pause about picking the Browns at all is you see all the turmoil going on and you see how poorly they're playing and how poorly Deshaun Watson's playing. And then when I see Deshaun Watson try to help up one of his offensive linemen and they smack his hand away. Oh, that was so overblown. It was overblown? I don't yes. know. There's people in Cleveland right now begging like, hey, please find another charge on this man so we can get rid of his contract. Well, because I know that, but I, I, I don't want to conflate those two things. The, I saw that the guard, Joel Batonio, said after where he's like, I'm just a big dude. Like I can't even get helped up in that way by anyone, let alone my quarterback. <laughs> He's like, I've probably done that before. He's like, if you want to go through the tape, there's a bunch of plays where Deshaun and I are like interacting and engaging in a good way. So stop fanning the the flames of that one, Chris. Oh, there's enough other. There's enough crazy stuff. Uh, all right, I'll, going I'll on go. With them. I'll go fan the flames of uh, of y'all got absolutely destroyed by the Cowboys. Yeah, yeah, they might just not be a very good. <laughs> um but uh but but okay so we so we're both picking the jaguars there sticking with the afc north games here raiders at ravens the ravens are have a pretty pretty big spread with with, with this game when i when i look at it I mean, look the raven the raiders you know no one's projecting them to be a, a very good team or anything like that but the ravens eight and a half point home favorites here brian let's let's put it this way i'm taking the ravens but i Part of me feels like this game's going to be within that spread because that eight and a half points is a lot. I'm seeing nine and a half on mine, and Ooh. I think the Ravens cover. I think they're going to stomp these guys. Stop the Raiders, it's over. Baltimore. Okay, yeah, it's it's over. It's over. It's over. <laughs> they're actually my survivor pick for this week. So, oh, half the half the people in that pool that I'm in lost week one taking the Bengals. The Bengals, over the yeah. Patriots. Your yeah, boy took the Tampa Bay Bucks. See that was see I was smart. See I, right now my philosophy is I'm taking whoever plays the Panthers. And I should yeah I, I should have charged. probably gone with the Saints <laughs> last week, but um, now I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the Ravens at home and hope that uh, Panthers spring an upset for anybody who's operating the same way oh. as you. Oh, that's, that's so hurtful. But at, let's let's keep it moving here. We both have the Ravens. Bengals at Chiefs. The Bengals also didn't look good. Now, they didn't get destroyed the way the Browns did, but they lost to a team that no one thought they would lose to, including myself. I didn't make them my survivor pick, but I did make them my uh, just a team that I picked last yeah. week. And now the Chiefs are five-and-a-half-point favorites. And I'm sorry, Brian. I need more points than just five-and-a-half on my end. I, I'm picking the Chiefs. You could make that ten-and-a-half points, and I'm going to still take it. Yeah, I think I'm with you on that one, Chris. I mean, maybe the Bengals got a little bit of a wake-up call uh, last week in that New England game. I, I was going to pick them in Survivor and switched at the last second for some reason. Thank goodness I did. I mean, it that's the, the Cincinnati is just another team that it, it feels like there's just a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff going on that might be impacting the focus there. Maybe losing to the Patriots will galvanize them, but no, I'm, I'm going Kansas City at home in – what do they call it? Burrowhead? I guess that hasn't really held up lately, considering the Chiefs have won the last two Super Bowls. Yeah, they've uh they've kind of put it put an end to that. I mean, though I do believe Joe Burrow is I think he's the last purse class quarterback to beat Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs, right? Yeah, I think that might be correct. And these two teams, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a really fun game to watch, although we won't be watching it because we'll be watching Steelers Broncos. But exactly. um, did you see the Bengals corner Cam Taylor Britt saying yeah. Xavier Worthy for the Chiefs? Uh, all he can really do is run straight. He can't really do anything else other than that. Hope you can keep up with him because he's pretty doggone uh, fast. <laughs> I like that stuff. Though. That trash talk, That's that that makes it fun. Uh, well, one trick pony, if you will. Yeah. Um, but that that certainly would be a big thing there. Let's look at some other games happening this weekend. Colts at Packers. The Colts are a very intriguing team to me with Anthony Richardson healthy. Meanwhile, Jordan Love is hurt, and they say it's day to day with his knee injury. You know, thank goodness for him because this is supposed to be his big year. And then if he was out for the whole season already, that'd have been just disastrous for Green Bay. But even with him, if, even if he does find a way to magically come back in this game, I'm still taking the Colts. They're three point favorites on the on the road. I think the Colts are a good team. Uh, you know, I think that they're I think they're kind of going to be in lockstep with the Steelers this year, which is going to make that matchup later this year. I think actually more important than people may have originally thought. These two teams might be battling for a wild card spot. Um, so I'm taking the Colts because I do think that they got something cooking there. 
I'm actually going to take the upset. My upset Whoa. special of the week. Now, don't look back at last week's show and, and <laughs> bring up my upset special from that one, which was, what was the that Jets. One? The Jets <laughs> straight up. And I'm going to double down and take the Packers straight up. Matt LaFleur builds a, a good enough plan around Malik Willis getting the start at home in Green Bay. Granted, it's only been his home for, what, a couple of weeks? So right. um, I just think that, yeah, the Lambeau Field faithful – are behind them and they scratch scratch out a win by a field goal or something like that. All right, all right. So there's there's our first split of the week. Jets at yeah, Titans, sure. the team the, the the team that you uh that you yeah. did pick for an upset last week, but the Jets this time are three and a half point road favorites over the Titans. I'm sorry. I know the Jets played play didn't play the best last week, but I'm taking them this week against the Titans. When I look at how Will Levis played, I mean, just that pick six. Where he just falls to his knees, hand on his head. I was like, dang, like that's just a bad side of things to come. I think this Jets defense can be for real, and I think that that can be the difference maker in this game. Um, I'm with you on this one, Chris. I, I'm pretty concerned about the Will Levis uh, start to the season, and I, I think Aaron Rodgers. You know, he looked good at times in that game, and they just you know couldn't keep pace with the Niners. But I think they go down to Nashville, take care of business in, in this one fairly handily, and maybe. Tennessee reporters are having the same young second year quarterback or uh, veteran Mason Rudolph debate we had so often last season. <laughs> boy, oh boy, that uh, Mason Rudolph starts for, starts with the Titans this year. That's gonna it's gonna be a it's gonna be a wild time. All right, Monday Night Football ending the week off the Falcons at the at the Eagles. Now, full disclosure, this game may not be the most enticing when you look at the matchup, but but I, I think, you know, it's interesting because this is a six and a half point spread. The Eagles are heavily favored in this game, but it'll be an interesting gauge to see how the team that the Steelers beat last week plays against one of the teams that I think a lot of people see as an NFC favorite to be a Super Bowl contender, um, at least a division contender and someone that can challenge the 49ers in the playoffs. Um, if the Falcons hold up in this game, it, I think it'll, it it might be a good sign. Granted, granted, like week to week, everything's different in the NFL. If they win this game, it doesn't mean that the Steelers are a leader or anything like that. But um, I'm taking the Eagles, but I do think the Falcons cover. I do think that this they find a way to keep this game close and the Eagles don't blow them out of the water. But I loved what I saw to Saquon Barkley last week. I think Jalen Hurts is really good. I think they have the weapons. Uh, I, think, I just think the Falcons score a little bit more ne- this week to keep up with the pace of it. But I'll take Philly. Yeah, you're you're right, Chris. I mean, it's we're going to learn more about the Steelers Sunday afternoon before we even get to Monday night football. But I mean, just in the early part of the season, you're trying to piece things together. You're trying to see which teams are feistier than you expected and, and which teams were all hype and, and not a lot of bark. So uh, or not a lot of bite, I guess I should say. But yeah, I mean, I think in this game, I you know, the, the Falcons, th- this is a desperate spot already for them in week two because they have the Chiefs in week three. And do you really want to start 0-2 and and then be staring down Kansas City with a new head coach, new quarterback? The honeymoon be over really quick for the Dirty Birds. Uh, I I disagree with you, Chris. I think the Eagles are going to blow them out of the water. I think think they're going to stomp the Dirty Birds in Philly. And it's it's going to be, uh, yeah, go Birds over Dirty Birds. So I think Jalen Hurts, Saquon Barkley, they'll all be energized in their first uh, game in front of their fans considering their home game last week was in brazil so i think the eagles buy a lot somewhere our good friend johnny mcgonagall just said go birds <laughs> uh but uh but absolutely all right so there's our picks picks for the pick six of the week we're going to get steelers broncos with our break with our breakdown of the key aspects of that game and our final score predictions there all here in the north shore drive podcast but first remind you the show is also brought to you by savinas kane and galusi they are your mesothelioma and as best as lawyers over 85 years of experience call them now today at savinas kane and galusi for a free consultation we're also brought to you by moon township honda which you can find at 5802 university boulevard in Moon Township, Pennsylvania, or on moonhonda.com. Here's a friend. Here's a message from my friends at Moon Township Honda. To build the Honda CRV hybrid, we took everything you love about the CRV and kicked it up a notch with greater power for a CRV unlike any before. Adventure confidently with Honda, Car and Driver's most awarded brand in 10 best history, the CRV and CRV hybrid, part of the Honda line of rugged vehicles. Visit your local Honda dealer where new vehicles are arriving daily. Buy online or reserve from select Honda dealers.
Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Chris Carter, Brian Batko. Uh, Brian, let's get to Steelers at Broncos. The Steelers with their second game of the season, second game on the road. They are two and a half point favorites, uh, but that line did move by half a point uh, as as the week went on. And I can't help but think part of that was because they that Vegas saw that Russell Wilson wasn't probably wouldn't be starting in 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 this game. Now it's still not definitive that he won't, but it's looking it's trending the way that Justin Fields is going to be QB one again for, for at least just this week here. Brian, if the Steelers are going to win this game against a rookie quarterback, they're facing a different style of team than, than last week. What's the biggest things? What are the biggest things that you think they have to check off their boxes to make sure that they stay on the path of their victory? I think for starters, one of the more concerning things from week one in Atlanta that almost bit them in the butt was just uh, a bunch of penalties in that game. Yeah. I mean, that's such a recipe for keeping I don't know if I want to call the Broncos an inferior team. I mean, we're one week into the season, but at the very least, they're a team that's more in a rebuilding mode than the Steelers. They've got a rookie quarterback. They've you know gutted the roster to some degree in terms of big money guys. So they're clearly a team that's playing for the future more than uh, the Steelers are comparatively. So don't have those mental lapses. To, you know, one saving grace for the Steelers, they didn't have any sort of you know, unnecessary roughness or unsportsmanlike conduct, stupid stuff like that. Just clean that kind of thing up. And from there, the Jimmys and Joes and the X's and O's should be able to get the job done. But I do wonder a little bit about the plan Sean Payton's going to have for the Steelers defense, because as I'm writing about for the Sunday paper, he's 3-0 and in his career against Mike Tomlin, albeit yep. that was with Drew Brees leading the way and not Bo Nix. Agreed. And I think that's the thing here. I think I think the Steelers look at this matchup and I think there's still a lot of similarities that you have to last week, which is really that's a lot of similarities to how they play in general. It's going to be, you know, don't turn the ball over. And on defense, find a way to put pressure on Bo Nix to have to beat you by throwing, by staying in the pocket, throwing down the field. Mike Tomlin talked Tuesday about how they, they, he saw that touchdown run that he had that was impressive. But he, the guy also threw zero touchdowns and two picks last week. Force him into those situations where this secondary that you've invested a lot into, you've been adding to, you've been developing. Let them be the playmakers that turn, that, that, that they create turnovers or your pass rush, which also looks looks pretty doggone good. Uh, on on the offensive side of the ball, Brian, you know we talked about this, and then you talked about this, um, you know you, you know a, a little bit as well this week. But Arthur Smith made a point to talk about how last week when people talk asked him about not throwing to the middle part of the field, he said, "Well, duh." Justin Simmons and Jesse Bates were there. Um, and so, like, okay, cool. I think that that's a very good thing. It was something I said going into the game was avoid the middle part of the field, work the sidelines, make life easier on yourself because you're not trying to score a whole bunch of points in this game. You're trying to control the ball, which they did. But this week you're facing Pat, Patrick Sertan. And in my book, that guy's the best cornerback in the, in, in the NFL right now. And if I'm the Steelers, I'm lining up George. If he follows George Pickens, I'm lining up George Pickens by himself on one side of the field and just keeping Patrick Sertan over there. And this is the week that I start throwing down the middle. I give Pat Fryermuth a lot of chances, the running game, a lot of chance to play at play action. I think this is a week where the Steelers could be targeting over the middle as long as they keep Patrick Sertan away from there. What say you about a, about that kind of a game plan? Uh, because Justin Fields said he's not scared to throw to George Pickens. Yeah, Justin Fields wisely pointed out, like, last week, A.J. Terrell was on him from the Falcons. And, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, maybe there's levels to this. And Pat Sertan might be, uh, you know, a level above even a guy like A.J. Terrell. But they're both decorated corners, very well compensated corners with good size, first-round picks. So they have the pedigree. So I see what Fields is saying there. He, he says he'll take his guy over anybody. But, man, I'm really looking forward to that one-on-one -on -one matchup it's it's a great unstoppable force meets a movable object two weeks into the season because everybody from fields to arthur smith to george himself are, are saying no we're, we're going to be getting the ball to pickens every week it's this isn't going to be the popcorn kind of target share that we saw his first couple seasons under matt canada no no it, it seems like it's going to be more justin jefferson cd lamb level of we are force feeding you the ball because you are far and away our best player well, all of a sudden, yeah, uh, let's see what he can do the second week of the season uh, against the guy who was briefly the highest paid defensive back in NFL history and who's 6'2", 205, and can play a physical brand of football. I'm with you, though. If if that's, uh, you know, less appealing to them, not not a lot of uh, personnel that scares me uh, in the middle of the Broncos 
yeah. defense. Brandon Jones is a vet at safety who's, who's been around the block. I don't know that he is what he once was when he was with the Dolphins, but I mean, he's he's seen a lot of ball. PJ Locke, he's a former undrafted free agent who actually mm-hmm. was by the Steelers in 2019, didn't make the team. I think PJ Locke was the first interview I ever did with a player on the Steelers beat because it would have been huh. a rookie mini camp right after I got uh, got the job at the PG. So that's a fun fact for you, but I still don't like his chances trying to cover Pat Fryer Muth or, you know, if it's Darnell Washington in the red zone or, or even Connor Hayward, who wasn't involved a ton in, in week one snap counter target wise, but Arthur Smith gave him some props for a good, uh, a good lead block on the one Justin Fields keep. Yeah. I think that that's certainly something to keep note of. All right. All that being said, it's time to give our final score predictions. Brian, how do you see this game playing out and what's your final score? Man, Chris, I'm going to, you might consider this a hot take, but I truly believe this. Had Russell Wilson started this game, I think I was going to take the Broncos in an upset just because of the, the intimate knowledge that Sean Payton has of what it might take to confuse him and and mess with him as a quarterback and uh, frustrate him and just kind of throw everything at, at the wall to try to beat that guy who clearly there was a rift between them by the end of their time. And I thought it was uh, kind of funny. Russell Wilson was asked about going back to Denver Thursday. And as he usually tends to do, uh, lists a laundry list of guys he played with and all the great um, bonds that he formed in those two seasons. He didn't mention my guy, former Pitt safety tight end Lucas, or uh, former Pitt tight end Lucas Kroll. Um, but, you know, that's all right. We'll let him off the hook for that. But he did not mention Sean Payton by name. And I don't think he mentioned any coaches from last year's staff. By name, I couldn't help but notice that. So I think Sean Payton would have just absolutely tried to, uh, yeah, throw the kitchen sink at him. Maybe my galaxy brain take here is Sean Payton will be so petty, he will <laughs> tank. So Justin <laughs> Fields will light him up. And and he goes up to Russell. He hugs Russell Wilson at the end of the game and says, you'll, you'll never work in this league again. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm kidding, mostly, kind of. But uh, – Anyway, long roundabout way of saying I've got the Steelers pulling this one out. Let's go 24-21 by a field goal again. They punch a few in. Chris Boswell does his job. But Bo Nix also has some moxie to him, makes a couple savvy plays, and they probably leave somebody open at some point uh, with a coverage bust against the Sean Payton offense. You have them You have them just covering barely there. I think they cover this easily, man. They've lost their I last don't... four games in Denver. Chris. This is true. They haven't won since 2009. And, and, and sometimes I hate those stats because it's mm-hmm. like when you say stuff like, um, you know, the Falcons haven't beaten the Steelers and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, everything's changed with the Falcons. That's irrelevant. But in this case, Mike Tomlin's been the head coach for all of those games. So is there something to the preparation for going out there? Is there something different you can do um, to, to make that somewhat unique trip to Denver? And yes, obviously his uh, failings against Sean Payton, well documented too. A lot of things to beat there. A lot of trends to buck. I think they buck all of them. I, I don't believe in this. I don't believe in this Denver offense. I don't believe much in Denver defense outside of Pat Sertan. I think this offensive line. When looking at the injury report, they got a lot of questions about who's even going to start on their side of the ball. And that against the Steelers defensive front, it's a lot scarier than the Steelers offensive line shifting around to deal with the Broncos defensive front. I say Steelers win twenty seven nine. In, in, in a final score here. I think that they I think they limit what the Broncos are able to do. I think that they get some points on the board, maybe even a defensive score to help with that. But I, I think this is a week where they, they they handle themselves pretty well, and then they head into the Chargers week feeling pretty confident uh, with their first home game. I don't know the last time the Steelers held a team under 10 points. I don't think it happened all of last season, Chris. So you're going out on a bit of a limb there. Hey, man, they held the Falcons to 10 points, so I think they can hold the Broncos to one point less. Mm, okay, well, Bo Nix can move, and I don't know if Kirk Cousins can. So yeah, this, is, this, is, this is true. That, that, hey, that throws I think a bit they, of a wrench into things. I think they like playing mobile quarterback because they, they, they're they they're pretty good at playing the one that starts for the Baltimore Ravens, and so I think Bo Nix will be interested in there. But 
either way, I do think this is going to be a, a, a game that tests a lot of different factors. You can check out all of those things as Brian does a great job reporting throughout the weekend. He will be at practice today, giving you a final look at how the Steelers are looking like going into the weekend. And of course, we'll have all your previews, all your analysis, and all your breakdowns at the game in Denver here at the Pittsburgh Post. Week 11, 2020, they beat the Jaguars 27 to 3. There you go. Just some quick research. Here. Oh yeah, okay. I, I actually didn't know the last time they had held someone under ten points. It feels like feels like that's what they they had to do to win games the last. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's I mean, obviously <laughs> difference between nine and ten, whatever. But yes, it, it feels like they've certainly smothered and suffocated some teams to get some wins with an anemic offense. Absolutely. He's Brian Batko. I'm Chris Carter. Thanks for checking out the Pittsburgh Post Gazette and the North Shore Drive podcast, where we are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every every Monday, Wednesday, Friday on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this channel to get all of our daily content from all of our sports writers. We're back here. We'll have our post game show with our guys in Denver recording their show to react to what happens with Steelers Broncos. And of course, Monday morning, the North Shore Drive podcast is back, breaking things down and getting you set up for the week all here on the North Shore Drive podcast. We'll see you there. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all the sports coverage from the Post-Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.